Welcome to Haunted Hospitality, Southern Stories Told by Spooky Gingers. I'm Robin. And I'm Zoe. And I have a story for you today. But first, Zoe, how's life? Uh, life's good. I, As I announced in one of the previous episodes, mm-hmm. um, I got a cat. His name is Toes. What? This is our second time doing the introduction because um, <laughs> he kind of ruined the first one. Yeah. Um, I had to take his bell collar off and he is now locked in the bedroom. Poor toes. Yeah, we tried to start it off with Zoe's wearing a specialty jacket that has literally cat toys hanging from the hood. And it had a pocket like a kangaroo for him to hang out in like a baby. And he just didn't want to stay there. Oh my god, she's showing me that the jacket hoodie has cat ears right now. Yeah. Oh, God. (laughs) And then he climbed onto the table, and then he was drinking the water. We got to flick at him to get him off the table. And I was just being super boring because I was trying to talk in hushed tones. As to not excite him. Yeah. Which is not entertaining, and that's the goal (laughs) of this podcast. Yeah. He's a little booger. I mean, he's not even one yet. He got fixed five days before he joined our household and we I don't share a household well yeah sorry I lo- I do share a household with somebody else but so. you would, yes yes well I just we're the only two people here yes <laughs> he he got fixed like five days before and so he's adjusting to our house well However, he recently has discovered that he can play and that he has zoomies. <laughs> and Aww. so um, he's a little bit of a booger and we're having a good adjustment period for him. Uh, he likes to do everything that we tell him not to, especially when we're trying to sleep. So <laughs> He's really the sweetest cat. He introduced himself to me by... I, I just had plopped myself down on Zoe's floor as... Within five minutes of being here, yeah. Oh, yeah, I just walked in and I sat down on her carpet. And he came up to me and he just, like, climbed on top of me and rubbed his face in my face, which mm-hmm. I guess is now his customary introduction as he keeps doing that, except this time he's climbed onto my shoulder, like, as I'm standing up. And I've never had a cat willingly do that to me before. <laughs> and I've had six cats total? Not that I know. Seven but... cats total. Okay. And I've never had one of them do that yeah which i mean it's nice yeah it's the best except for when he's uh up there and he wants to get down and you're trying to balance and he's trying to move and then you're trying to balance and then it freaks him out so he digs his claws in and now your back's yeah so that wasn't my experience (laughs) but i'm i I empathize thank you see how that could be hurtful (laughs) so what about you robin how's life well I hope this comes across as good sound because we're drum rolling. Um, da 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 da! I got my first paycheck in ten months. Yay! Yay! Don't graduate during the pandemic. Yay! But yeah, yeah. I have a job and I've been working on it for about a month, and then they paid me recently, and I was just tickled. To tickled. Receive money. <laughs> tickled. Positively tickled to receive money. So, what did you spend your first paycheck on? Oh, um, I, a bridesmaid's dress immediately just funneled <laughs> directly into the bridesmaid's dress. Uh, it wasn't that. It wasn't that. I mean, it was a David's Bridal bridesmaid's dress, so it actually wasn't too expensive. And, and it's gorgeous on you. Thank you. And then it did end up getting a discount, so okay. that was nice. So It kind of sounded like you said Dick's count. <laughs> she said discount. Discounts. Yeah. <laughs> it was a discount for twenty dollars. The dress minus twenty dollars to the total of the dress. In total, I paid one hundred and fifteen dollars in change for this dress, okay. which is a pretty good price for a bridesmaid's dress. Yes, yes. The one I was thinking about at a different place that I did not like as much was two hundred and forty dollars. Ooh. Once I saw that it was two hundred and forty dollars, I stopped thinking about it. Yep, yep. That's yeah. usually how it goes. The place we were at didn't have really good air conditioning, and I was burning up, sweating, getting stressed, mm. and I was like, this dress looks okay. I want to stop trying on dresses right now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But then we went to David's Bridal, and everything turned out fine. 
Yeah. Uh, plug to David's Bridal. No, I'm kidding. They are not sponsoring And they are us. sponsoring this no. episode. <laughs> For legal reasons, we have to admit that they are not sponsoring this episode. <laughs> For legal reasons, that is a joke. That's going to be our new hashtag. I was just thinking that we say for legal reasons a lot. Yeah, for legal reasons, this is a joke. Which, honestly, okay, so I don't know if you say that before you heard me say it, but I picked that I up. I think so. I picked that up off of TikTok because I'm addicted to TikTok. So we are stealing from TikTok. I like that. We're referencing a meme from TikTok. Okay, fine. <laughs> <laughs> so anything else? Oh, well, now that you bring up TikTok, I just watched... I watch this one person on TikTok maybe, like, once every month, and uh-huh. she's so funny. I, her name is Chris. I don't know anything else. But Call me Chris. With the characters? Yes. <gasps> I yes. love her. She's one of the most popular TikTokers. TikTokies? Tik- I would say TikToker. Tik- creators. That's what they call them. They call them Creators. I mean, you can't Robin see Robin just rolled her <laughs> eyes. <laughs> I mean, I, I really like her, so she can be called a creator. Uh-huh. Um, I am really judgmental of TikTok just in general, mm-hmm. but that's more of just me being a fetty daddy. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. I, I, I mean, I'm ashamed of it. It's my guilty pleasure. It's just, uh, it's so much easier to just zone out and absorb minute or less uh, little bits of information th- and just waste hours on that than it would be to like watch a TV show for three days because it's like I don't have to have an attention span longer than a minute and if I feel like a video is going long I can just go and swipe to the next one. As creators of a podcast that lasts 55 minutes we officially disagree with everything that we just <laughs> said. <laughs> Listen. <laughs> uh, but yeah. So that's life. Yeah. Okay, well, life is good. That's good. I feel like there was something else I was supposed to mention. Let's you mentioned something out. about, like, our tagline? Oh, yeah. Okay. That was the point where the little boy started getting crazy. Yes. Toes. Okay, yeah. So our tagline. I wanted to bring this up to Which you. Which is spooky stories told by Southern Gingers. Yes. Yes. That is accurate for you. Spooky. No, no, no. Opposite. Opposite. It's no. Southern Stories Told by Spooky Gingers. Is which, it? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. It oh is Southern Stories. We don't know our own tagline. Yay! Southern Stories Told by Spooky Gingers. Mm-hmm. I've been thinking about this. That only describes you. I'm not spooky. Anyone who has ever met me is like the first. their first thought, even if, without this podcast. Just like, you know what? That girl isn't. She's not spooky. <laughs> You know what what word people use to describe me the most? Is it spooky? No, it's what? not spooky. What is it? And I have proof for this. It's somewhere in my closet right now, but I could pull it out. So I was an orientation leader for USC in 2016. I know. It's on your Twitter bio. I actually Twitter removed bio. it this weekend. Okay. So um, I was an orientation leader, and it was the closest I've come to joining a cult. Loved it. Loved I every mean, minute did. of it. Mm-hmm. But I would never do it again. It like it changed who I was in a good way. It made me more extroverted, and it made me a lot better with dealing with people. You got really good at public speaking. Yes, because I mean, I literally was working like from seven in the morning to midnight every other day, you know. And then the other day, I was working from six in the morning to six p.m. So, and in the summer heat. Is that legal? It technically wasn't a job. <laughs> I mean. So you did that without money? Well, we got a leadership stipend. Okay, USC. Yeah. (laughs) But, I mean, I loved it. I loved every minute of it. They fed us. Like, it was great. And I'm very glad I did it because I wouldn't be the person I am today without doing it. So we went on a trip, and it was either Shro, which is a regional conference where we um, interact with other orientation leaders and we learn things, or it was the trip that we went on where we bonded with the or- other orientation leaders. On the way back from the trip, uh, we all had a piece of paper with our names printed on it. And we had to pass it along the bus. And we all had to write like what we think about that person. That's my worst nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, we would get Joe Bob's thing, and I'd be like, Joe Bob, it was so funny that you told this Why joke around. Why is Joe around. Bob always the fake Listen. name? Come <laughs> <up with. laughs> 
but it would be like Joe Bob funny story that you told around the campfire last night, you know, that kind of thing. I had one person write in really big letters, bubbly girl. Like they called me bubbly, right? And then like five people pointed to the word bubbly and said retweet or yes, or that's exactly what I was going to say. Everybody calls me bubbly. That's what they call me. You know, I can see that. I also think that I wouldn't have agreed with it before you were an orientation leader. Right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a reason why I have to stand like a foot away from my mic and you have to be right <laughs> up on it. I'm a pretty loud person. By the way, I'm going to scoot back a little bit. There we go. She just flailed y'all <laughs> in the chair. But yeah, so I don't think I would consider myself spooky either. But we're telling spooky stories, so I feel so like So then that's... it would be spooky stories told by Southern gingers, except you're not Southern. You've said. I, I don't no. know why my absolute goal in this podcast is to get you to admit that you are Southern. Are southern. You know, I mean, that's a very personal thing, and I'm going to respect that and stay on my side of the table. As opposed to fighting me? <laughs> As opposed to throwing my hands? My side, I, I was merging the metaphorical with the physical. Oh, okay. I'm not going to throw hands over okay. your regionality. <laughs> regionality? Regional. This isn't interesting. No. <laughs> Okay. Uh, before we get into the story, let's do the something Southern. So we decided to go ahead with a kind of game show theme for this episode and next episode. Yeah. So in this episode, since Robin is telling the story, I will be the one quizzing her. I have 10 cities in front of me. Some of them are real cities. Okay. Some of them are fake cities. Okay. You need 10 points to pass. So I need to get all 10 correct. No. Oh my god. Because I will ask you, I will say... This is complicated. <laughs> here's the city name. Mm-hmm. If you get it right, if you say it's true or false, or real or fake, if you get it right, you get two points. Or you can ask for the state. If you ask what state it is in, and I uh, tell you what state it's in, and you get it right, you get one point. Okay, so I'm assuming these are all states that we've decided are in the South and are officially yes. Southern map. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I really want to do amazing at this, but also now that I said that, I worry I'm not. So are you ready for the first? Yeah, I'm ready. <clears throat> Our first city. She's tickled, y'all. Is Boogertown. It exists. Two points for Robin. <laughs> it is in North Carolina. Fun fact, that's my least favorite word. Not North Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> Booger? Yeah, I don't even... Uh. So the second city. Glimmer. True. Uh, ah. No, it is not true. I said t- Glimmer, Texas. Texas was the fake state I decided. Okay. Texas doesn't exist. Yes, Texas does not exist. Okay. Uh, don't listen to episode four. <laughs> okay. uh, number three. Mm-hmm. Scratch ankle. False. Uh, ah! Scratch ankle, Alabama is a very real city. Oh my god. Okay. Uh-huh. The number four. The city of North. It's true, it's in South Carolina. Boo boo. I'm going to give you three points for oh, that Oh, yeah. One. I didn't know that was a possibility. Neither did I. Okay. All right. Uh, number five. The city of La Crosse. I think it does exist, but yeah, it, it exists. Very true. It is in Florida. So another okay, two on. points for you. You are currently at seven points. We so will I'm continue really even if you. If yeah. You, yeah. 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 We'll get all ten in. The number six, Tacoville. No. Good job. Another two points. Okay, I was, when you made that face, I was really worried that there was a Taco Bell town. <laughs> <laughs> I, I decided that Tacoville would be in Virginia if it existed. Wait, oh, you said Tacoville? 
Yeah, Taco Bell. I thought you said Taco Bell, and I was like, there's no way there's a town called Taco Bell, and I don't know about it already. Uh, (laughs) I probably would have said yes. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, number seven. The town or city of hot coffee. Well, now I'm wondering if you were just making up food things. Um, No, it doesn't exist. Very incorrect. Oh, it does? Hot Coffee, Mississippi is a real city. Is it one word? No, but it's two words. Oh, my God. (laughs) Okay, number eight. Stamps. It's true. It exists. Yes, it's in the city that is AR. Air... Arkansas. Arkansas. And you just called Arkansas a city. It's in the state that is AR. Listen, I'm not You know we good. cover Arkansas. Yes, <laughs> that's why it's in here. We appreciate you, Arkansasians. Actually, nobody from Arkansas Excuse listens me, to us. Excuse me, I am confusion. Why is it Kansas but not Arkansas? Oh, yeah. Isn't I, it legal in Arkansas to pronounce it as Arkansas? Legal or illegal? Illegal to pronounce it as Arkansas. You know, I don't know. I know very little about Arkansas because we haven't done a story about Arkansas yet. Number nine. The city of Yeti. What state? Tennessee. No. Correct. Okay, good. You get one point for that. So I think the Yeti isn't in this area. No, but I was going off the brand of water bottles, honestly. Well, yeah, but they get their name from the mythological creature, the Yeti. Well, I, I would totally believe it if Tennessee had a town dedicated to Yeti products. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway... Okay, number 10, avocado. That's true. Incorrect. <gasps> you really were just naming them off of food. <laughs> well, I would say... Were you hungry? No. Okay. I would base it, the fake ones off of cities, like Glimmer. There was a Glimmerville, but there was not a Glimmer. <gasps> you tried to trick me. I did. And I I didn't have enough knowledge to be tricked. Well, Robin, congratulations. You got 12 points. Therefore, you won. And you want to know what you won? Yeah. Absolutely nothing. Yay. (laughs) Thank you. All right. Do you have a story for us? No. Okay. Yes. Okay, guys. Guys. We are listed under Apple Podcasts as true crime. And people are probably like, where's the true crime at? We we had a little bit in episode two, and I think we had it in episode four, because I'm suspicious of Sheila's husband, <laughs> if you remember. But now, the, here it is. A, our first episode, not a ghost in sight, unless we catch an EVP on this microphone while recording. That would be so cool. That really would. What would we possibly even do? We would just be like, hey, guys, listen to this EVP. I would flip out. I mean, yeah, I mean, our personal thing, but, like, what do we do with that? Like, we just release it and we let people know ghosts exist? I guess, yeah. Ghosts exist. Ghosts exist. Ghosts. Anyway, there are no ghosts in this episode. (laughs) Except for the 12 times we just said the word ghost. Yeah, other than that. But, Zoe. Yes. Have you heard of the Wolfirk family axe murders? Maybe. Oh, what state? really? Georgia? No. Okay, good. For me. <laughs> and for the audience. I am reading a serial killer book right now, and they did mention, like, three axe murders. And, yeah. But I think one of the one that, only one that was in the South was in Texas. This is not... In Texas? A serial killer. Okay. Though there are multiple murders. Okay. She's 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 doing that gif where it's like that woman looking at the math and the math is going on. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm guessing it was multiple murders in one night, one household. You know what? Don't tell my story before I do. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm sorry. So, in 1855, Richard Wolfirk. It doesn't look like it's pronounced Wolfirk, but it is. He was 20 years old. Okay. He had just graduated from a university. It was either you know, I think it was the University of Georgia. It doesn't matter. He married 13-year-old Susan Moore. Wow. That's yeah. an awesome thing. Great way to start off this story. Yeah. Um, they immediately had children. 
immediately had children. Great. Yes. They had two daughters, uh-huh. one of whom's name was Fluoride. <laughs> That's what a 13-year-old would name her daughter. Yeah. And then they had one boy named Tom who was born in 1860. Okay. Did the second daughter not get a name? The second daughter just doesn't show up a lot in this research. It seems maybe she was a bit more estranged from the family and the situation, which I can kind of see why she would keep her distance. Yeah. Anyway, so if you know anything about the date 1860, you know that shortly following this, the Civil War happened. And you this already ha- know that I know nothing about U.S. history, so I believe we, you. Zoe, you and I took South Carolina history together in the eighth grade, and you're telling me you don't remember anything? Yes. Okay. Miss Adams would be ashamed. I remember the grizzly game that we played. What? Like, there was what? like a Taz knockoff. What? If you got it wrong. What? I don't know any of the words you're talking about. I re- what I remember from that class is this one girl who just shot me the evil eye. And I'm not going to mention her name, but she did because I was excited about learning that the final Harry Potter movie trailer was coming out. Ah, uh, you are one of those ki- No, I'm kidding. I was one of those kids too. I'll tell you the name after this. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so, anyway, now that we're done sh- talking about that, okay, Civil War. Mm-hmm. This is in Georgia. Richard, the dude who married the 13-year-old, fought in it. So far, he's not looking great to me. No, because I'm assuming reasons. he's in the Confederacy. Yes. Georgia was a member of the Confederate States. Listen. <laughs> Good history fact. <laughs> Listen, I did get them swapped in fourth grade. Oh, you did. Yeah, she she got her cardinal directions wrong, and she was like, the South won. Yeah, but, <laughs> but it, was because, it was because I thought South was up and North was down. And it and I also thought that East was West and West was East, okay? I It's like they turned the thing upside down for Zoe, me. Zoe, can you lift your left hand for me? Okay, she got it right. <laughs> okay, so during the war, while Richard was off fighting, Susan, her daughter, who didn't have a name, right. Fluoride, and Tom went to live with Fanny, her sister. Okay. Yes. And they lived in Athens. By the way, oh, God, she's going to sneeze. <laughs> she sneezed. Bless you. Thank you. So they lived in Athens. Yeah, I'm on bullet point number two. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so they lived in Athens during the war, so from 1860 onward unfortunately susan died in 1865 Mm -hmm. which really sucks imagine just you get married at 13 you immediately have three kids and then you die and then you die anyway i just felt bad about that um richard remarried about two years after that in 1867 he is 11 years older than this wife, but she is legal and it's a lot less gross because she's 21 and he's 32. And you're like, okay, for the time, all right, fine. Yeah. Her name is Maddie. Hold on. Does Richard have his three kids or did those kids stay with Fanny? Huh, the kids stayed with Fanny. Okay. He married Maddie. Maddie and him had a son named Richard Jr. And then Richard Sr. was like, all right, kids, come back to Macon. By the way, they're from Macon. Woo. Yes. I used to live there. Yeah, you did. Yeah. Well, I mean, people listening don't necessarily know that. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And also, I just want to bring up, Zoe, do you watch The Office? I always forget. No, I do not. Oh, right. So you don't get this. But uh, Office Watchers, do you remember Andy Bernard, who there was like one thing where he said that for the first seven years of his life, he was named after his dad, and then they had the second child, and then they decided that that son... uh, should be the one to carry on the father's legacy, changed Andy's name to Andy, which they got out of a baby book, and made that kid the junior. This situation reminds me of it, because it's like, okay, you got unnamed kid, fluoride, Tom, and then you got Richard Jr. Right. From another marriage. Yeah. Tom wasn't apparently good enough to be Richard Jr. Nope. Or Richard II. Yes. I'm just saying, if you're talking about carrying on legacy, Richard Jr. sounds less good than Richard II. Okay, yeah. Do, do you see what I mean? Yeah, I get it. Yeah, because Richard the Second 
it's like the better <laughs> sequel. But Richard Jr. is just like it's a diminutive. smaller version of the Richard. original Richard. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So Tom, Fluoride, the other one, go back to Macon and they live with uh, Richard, Richard Jr. and, and Maddie. Maddie. Yes. And the daughters are like, okay, Maddie is our stepmom. We're going to respect her. We're going to like her. She's part of our family. And, and Tom was like, no. I don't like her. I don't want to be around her. I, this is gonna. I'm gonna make this difficult. We're gonna just have a difficult relationship. Okay. And he didn't. Growing up, he didn't always live with Maddie and Richard, but he kind of did a lot of time. But sometimes he would live, go back and live with Fanny in Athens. Sometimes, like when his sisters, because they were older, when they got up and got married and stuff, sometimes he would live with them instead. And he just. It seems looking at it like it's maybe one of those situations where it's like. The dad went and got a new family, so he's kind of, he's there, but he's not completely there, so he's, like, half a part of that family, you know what I mean? yeah. And at some point during all this, Maddie's father gives her and Richard, like, jointly a 867-acre piece of land. Dang. Yeah. Or actually, maybe he gave him a lot of land. Anyway, somehow they end up with 867 acres of land. Okay. From him or adding on to what they originally had because they're still living in the same farmhouse that Tom was born in, so I'm kind of confused about all of that. <clears throat> and so, in basically for Richard Woolfolk, that means that Woolfolk, it's spelled Woolfolk, it's so confusing. Basically for him, that means that he is fairly well-to-do in the area. He has sharecroppers, which is the practice that took over after slavery, um, but he doesn't have a lot of ready money but they're not worried financially or anything okay yeah and tom is 19 and his dad decides to give him 75 acres of land okay which is really nice uh because out of the first three kids from his first marriage tom is the only one that isn't well like isn't taking care of himself and by that i mean he's not independently financing himself right um, so the dad was like, okay, you're going to get 75 acres. You're going to do something with it. Tom tried to open up a general store. It didn't go well. I guess it went out of business. So okay. then after that, Tom went to Texas to see if he could get involved in horse trading. Okay. Yeah, I thought that was a bit of a random That was twist. like a jump, yeah. Yeah, but he tried that and it didn't work. And he came back and he opened up a liquor store. Ooh, that's always going to succeed. No, it's not. Specifically oh, no. at this time in history in this location. Prohibition wasn't a thing, but there were a lot of temperance groups that wanted prohibition to be a thing. Gotcha. So about half the population in Bibb County, which Macon is in, was totally morally against alcohol. Gotcha. So you're not getting a lot of business. He ended up having trying to have... Like, it, okay, the liquor store didn't work here, so he would move it over here. He, and then he would move it over there. He ended up having three locations, obviously not at the same time for it. And it didn't end up working. Gotcha. Yeah. So it ended up closing in 1887, officially. Okay. And then he starts asking people for money. At this point, he's 27 years old. Okay. He spent his adulthood trying to figure it out. His dad even tried to get him... A job as a streetcar operator, which Tom lost in a week. Okay. He's just not very good at stability. But he asks Fr- Fanny for money. She says no. And he's just kind of behind on the game. There is one cool thing that happens to Tom. Uh, he's on a train, and he okay. we- meets a woman. He meets a 17-year-old girl. (laughs) (laughs) And he's 27. Yeah. Okay. These Wolfark men are, like, just really good at marrying teenagers. Yeah. Good job, guys. Good Uh, job. He meets Georgia Bird on a train, and as you do with men you meet on a train, they eloped. Oh. Yes. Like, the day they met. Or around then. I, I, you know, I mean, it it was just kind of like they met on a train and then they got married. Wow. And it said eloped, so I figure it was quick. Okay. Yes. So for the next three weeks, he, okay, so he was like, hey, listen, honey, before you marry me, or I'm trying to convince you to marry me, he's like, I've got a place for us to live. Uh-huh. Which is like thing number one you need 
Yeah. If you're going to marry somebody, you need to live somewhere. And she's like, okay, great. They get married. And he's like, honey, let's move in with my sister. Because <laughs> he doesn't have a place to live. And so they move in with his sister, Floride. Okay. And for three weeks, Georgia is hanging in there. And actually, we have a verbatim account from her. Oh, no. That I'm going to read. Uh-huh. In a Southern debutante accent. Oh, gosh. Yes. We've learned how Southern accents go. Yes. In the first place, Tom Wolf... Fur- <laughs> <laughs> Actually, turns out... In the first place, Tom Wolf... Fooled me. <laughs> you have to admit that it's a really hard phrase to say. He said he had a place ready for me and everything to make a wife comfortable. I thought from my knowledge of the family that he was telling the truth. I went to live with Mrs. Edwards, that'd be Fluoride, his sister in Macon. Three days afterward, I found that he had no place to carry me to. After two weeks, during which time Mr. Wolfolk, Wolfork, <laughs> I can't say this name in his other accent. After two weeks, during which time Mr. Wolfork did nothing, I began to find out his true nature. He then began to mistreat me, and he frequently told me that I would not like his parents. Finally, during the third week, his parents visited us. Tom Wolfork was absent, and they met me very pleasantly and received me as a daughter. After he came back, I told him what nice people they were, and he said, Wait till you see more of them, and began cursing and said, The property shall not do them any good. I will burn them up first. After that, he threatened them, and frequently had something to say about his being kept out of his rights. I had then ceased to have anything to do with him, and I could not stand his evil ways. Finally, my mother came and brought me home. After three weeks' stay, I was dissatisfied the next, mor- I was dissatisfied the next morning after I married him and would have come home had I had an opportunity. This evening, Mrs. Edwards, his sister, told me she knew he had mistreated herself and me both badly and that she was afraid he would kill me. That's and what happens when you marry somebody you've known for less than three days. I mean, okay. I feel very bad for Georgia. Right. I'm... Okay, you're 17. Because the thing is, okay, we're going back to the 1800s. Okay. Now, if you hear that, okay, the girl who's a senior in your high school met a guy on a train who was 27 and they got married, that's really weird. But maybe then it was a little bit more normal. Maybe. Because people got married really quickly. I feel like there was an an official, like, courtship thing that they had to go through, though. Like, you have to meet the parents, and you have to do this, and it has to be arranged. So, based on the timeline that I know of, there wasn't time for that. Okay. Yeah. Not saying she was pregnant. She wasn't pregnant. Not that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But certain things happen afterward, and certain people said she was married three months to him before certain things happened. So, uh, I don't think there was a huge courtship period. Yeah. But. But I feel like there should have been. <laughs> well, yes. yes. Okay, 17-year-olds, don't marry 27-year-old men you meet well, on the train. Well, I mean, even for that time, I feel like generally that's what they do. So, I feel like she's, like, it's a little bizarre, and I feel like other people would have found it bizarre if she had married him like that. Okay, that's a good point. I was really impressed with her mom yeah, for coming her... and taking her back. Were they able to get a divorce? That comes up later. Okay. 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 Yeah. Yeah. I was really struck by the last sentence where she said that Fluoride, his sister, said like on the evening that she was going to leave. I think that because she says this evening, Mrs. Edwards said right. this. And I think that she's talking about when her mom came and got her. Mm-hmm. Mrs. She said that Fluoride said that Tom had mistreated them both badly and that she was afraid that Tom would kill Georgia. To me, that screams of physical abuse. Right. And, I mean, she says that he abuses me badly. He yes. tra- mistreats her badly. Well, she, she didn't say the word abuse. Then, so she went back to stay with her parents. Mm-hmm. And Tom tried to keep in touch with her. Okay. He would go and write her love letters. Uh-huh. Um, but they were bizarre love letters, so oh, they were no. written in really bad handwriting. 
and they were really hard to understand. Like, even without the handwriting, it's just, like, maybe he wasn't the most literate. Okay. Um, but he would write her love letters, but sometimes it would, they would be really weird because he would be quoting prayers. And, like, so there's this one in particular where he just quoted this one prayer completely, and that was the only letter, and he was, like, that was the only part of the letter, mm-hmm. except for him telling her to say that prayer daily, uh-huh. which is just... A weird thing to send your estranged wife yeah. <laughs> who maybe you're trying to get back. And he would visit her, and it sounds like sometimes she would see him, but, like, not – she didn't want to. Right. And then finally she told her dad that she didn't want him around anymore, so her dad told him to leave. Again, you know what? Good job on the parents. Right. You know, they're like – They weren't <sighs> like, you You are the one who married him, so you have to go and perform your wifely duties. No, they were like, this guy's a creep, and we're getting you from there, and you can just live with us. And, I mean, imagine being in this situation, because divorce, it's 1887. Yeah. That doesn't happen. And, I mean, you're just stuck. You can't marry again. You're 17 years old, and you can't marry again just because you were with a guy for three weeks who was mean to you. Right. That sucks. Anyway, uh, when George's dad told him to leave, Tom told George's dad, he said, Papa, shake hands with me. I want you to shoot me right through the head. Oh my gosh. That's a weird couple of sentences. So, like, I want to bring something up, but I hope it doesn't, like... I mean, we already know these are axe murders, and you've already brought up that he's abusive and a little weird, and I'm pretty sure he's the one who's going to be killing the whichever no. family. Okay, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, Maybe. So, yes. I've heard a lot of stories where the killer, like somebody who's about to kill somebody or has killed someone, says, you need to lock me up. You need to stop me. I can't stop myself. (sighs) And so I wonder if that was like a legitimate, like, hey, I'm having bad thoughts. You need to stop me before I do anything. That would make sense. Sometimes with these older articles... I'm wondering, how do you make sure you get things verbatim? So, Mm -hmm. you know, I've been the person who's trying to write down people's (laughs) sentences really quickly so I can make sure I'm getting it verbatim. And I know it's difficult to do. And especially in this case, because obviously George's dad didn't just go to the newspapers and was like, guess what weird thing happened with my son-in-law today? This was people who came to him after a certain event happens (laughs) for a quote. Mm -hmm. And I was like... But I completely trust that this is a verbatim quote because yeah. it starts, Papa, shake hands with me, and then the rest of it. You don't forget that. Yeah, th- th- I was about to say, like, that's something that you would remember. I can quote certain things in my life even now, and I don't have the, the greatest memory because it was that important to me, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. So, like, I feel like something like that, that ingrains itself on your brain. Yes. I real quick want to make a note about the love letters and my personal opinion of love letters. Okay. Actually, it's not my personal opinion. It's Jane Austen's personal opinion of love letters. That you share? Yes. I agree with this. So in Pride and Prejudice, Lizzie Bennet says, and I think it's, I saw, I mean, I saw the movie more recently, of course, than I read the book, but I think I read this part in the book too. She says, okay, love letters are nice if you're both deeply in love with each other. Mm -hmm. That can be cool. Otherwise, you don't want to send a love letter. Like, okay, let's say you like each other. There's nothing that can turn it worse than a badly written love letter. Right. Or like a love letter that's a bit too much or just, okay, if you're trying to win somebody back like he is, don't write them a love letter. Right. It's just a bad idea. Relationship advice. (laughs) (laughs) Relationship advice with Robin. Ooh, I like it. We should do that again. (laughs) Anyway, yeah. Yeah, So just don't send love letters unless you're actually completely in love with a person. Because the thing is, you don't write, you might write well, but you don't necessarily write well. Yeah. So it's June 1887. Tom is not doing well. His 17-year-old wife left him. I'm sorry, I just keep bringing that up. I just, (laughs) what is up with all these young marriages? Yeah. Wait, young on the woman's side marriages. Yeah. Sucks. Okay, June 1887, he's sad. His wife left him. He doesn't really have a... Like, he has family who will let him stay with them, but he doesn't have a place of his own. He has been trying for eight years to be a stable person, but he's just finding that he can't. Yeah. He visits his Aunt Fanny in Athens one last time. 
And she is alarmed by his behavior. Oh, no. He is pacing back and forth in a room in her house, holding a gun and muttering under his breath. Yeah, I'd be alarmed, too. Yeah, I don't know how long that visit happened, but I, man, I'd be trying to get that guy out of the house. I don't know. I think I'd be on the couch and I would be sitting very, very still, T-Rex, like as if there's a T-Rex, you know, the whole don't move, otherwise he'll see you kind of thing. Like, I would be sitting on the couch and just waiting for him to leave. I love that we have safety maneuvers for just in case (laughs) T-Rexes come back. (laughs) Just the amount that he is freaking out the women in his life astounds me. Because fluoride, the ant, and fluoride really loved him. Yeah. I'll get into that later, maybe. I don't know. I didn't put it in my notes, but because I was like, is it important that fluoride loved him? But now I'm really caring about fluoride. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's in all of our water. Like, guys, this is crazy. Their government's using it to track us. Um, for legal reasons, we are very pro-chemicals. <laughs> Yes. In this podcast. <laughs> also, everything get your is, vaccine. Everything is a chemical. You hey, can't what, have anything without chemicals. What vaccine did you get? I got Moderna. I got Pfizer. Well. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I didn't mean to get Pfizer. Oh, you know what? This is a tangent. Yes, a tangent. A, a tangent. So now we will segue back into oh, our content. We and, just both, like, pointed at our computers <laughs> Anyway. That's where we're holding the content. Um, okay, so a certain amount of time later. Yes. I can't exactly. Six weeks before something big happens. Okay. Bur- a man named Birch Horn. <laughs> His name's Burnt Horn? Birch Horn. Birch Horn. Yes. A man named Birch Horn. Okay. Has to talk to Richard Wolfork about an engine, which I'm assuming is a car, because, okay, it's a complicated thing that doesn't matter. So Richard sold Birch an engine, which I'm assuming means a car. Uh-huh. And then Birch heard that Richard regretted selling Birch the car. So Birch was like, I'm going to be nice about this and just be like, hey, do we want to work it in? So I'm renting it from you instead. So he was going to, like, pay rent for the car or something, okay. and they communicated about this. Anyway, he's going up to the house Tom's in the yard. Tom calls out to him, and he said, you want to see him about those notes? And Birch says, yeah, like, assuming he's talking about, okay, I'm going to pay you for the car or something. Mm -hmm. And Tom says, you need not be in any hurry about paying them. You'll have to pay them to me anyhow. Okay. So he's saying, like, you don't have to pay my dad for the car. You'll end up paying me for the car. And then Birch was like, how so? This is from a newspaper, by the way. (laughs) And Tom said, that's best known to myself. Okay. Okay, the next line in this Savannah Morning News article says, Mr. Horn, thinking it was all right, turned his horse and returned home. That's not a sentence that you're like, yeah, everything's fine after. No. I don't know. Like, the red flag of it. Yeah, but, I mean, I'm guessing it's like the whole, like, good old boy southern thing, you know? Where it's, like, you trust him just because he's part of this family. Trusting, but, like, you're also saying, oh, don't worry about paying my dad that money. You'll soon be paying me that money. Then again, maybe he thought his dad was just going to give him ownership of the car so the lease would turn to him. Yeah. And I have a tendency where I'll notice red flags, but I'm like, well, maybe I'm jumping to conclusions, so I'm not going to say anything, you know? Zoe, I'm being completely serious. If you ever see somebody with a red flag around me... Let me know, because I want to know that stuff. Okay. Sometimes people aren't good at seeing the red flags that are around them and closest to them. So, like, even if it makes you look, like, invasive, sometimes it's good to just say, here's what I'm noticing. Okay, so, suspicious conversation happens. Uh Uh-huh. Tom asks his dad for his inheritance. Okay. He's like, listen, we know eventually you're going to die. Okay. He doesn't say this. I'm making up this conversation. Okay. He says, you know, eventually you're going to die. And I would like to get what's going to happen when you're going to die, but right now. Okay. And Richard is like, no, my stuff is still my stuff. I'm not dead yet, bro. Yeah. But he says, I can hire you on as a field hand. Okay. Which is good. So the thought is Tom's going to live with him for a bit, work as a field hand. And I do think that ended up messing with Tom's head a bit. Because here you are, and you're this guy's oldest son, 
and you're you're hired on as the help which mm-hmm. like i honestly think that richard giving his son a field hand job was probably the best thing that could have happened for tom in that in that moment because tom would have squandered anything right. you know but that's not how tom saw it yeah Okay, so I'm going to give you a little bit of a review of the family because Maddie and Richard got busy and there's five more kids. Oh, okay. Hi. Yes. Hi. So they live in a one-story house. It's four rooms, but from context, it seems like four big rooms, okay? okay. And they live in an area that is so – they're kind of surrounded by sharecroppers, tenant farmers. I'm not exactly sure of, like, the, the details of all this. Um, and they have a lot of land – and in the four rooms, one of them is kind of like a living room type of thing. Uh, the rest are bedrooms. So Tom shares a room with Richard Jr., okay, who was 20 at this point. And he shares it with Charles, who okay. is five. Then there is the room for the girls. And the girls at this point are Pearl, who is 17 years old, okay. Annie, who is 10, mm-hmm. and Rosebud, who is 7. The parents have a room, and so it's the two of them, but the baby, they call her the baby. She, They named the youngest kid Maddie after the mom. Mm-hmm. She's 18 months, and they're kind of doing a family bed thing where the kids sleep, the 18-month-old sleeps with the parents. Gotcha. Yeah. And Tom lives there for a bit, and it starts to get a bit tense. Mm-hmm. with everybody, especially between him and Richard Jr. Mm-hmm. So on August 5th, we're getting down to very specific dates, and so if you are a true crime person, you know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> on August 5th, Tom and Richard Jr. get into a bit of a scuffle in the front yard because Richard Jr. was riding his horse around, left it in the yard to do something else, and Tom was like, I want to go get some whiskey, took the horse. It's like I took your car to go on an errand and didn't ask you for it, and now we're right. fighting about it. Comes back... And now he and Richard are having an argument in the front yard. You took my car. And then Maddie, not 18-year-old Maddie, but 18-month-old Maddie. Uh-huh. But the mom Maddie. The, the mom Maddie, the stepmom, comes out and is like, Tom, you took his car. <laughs> and just kind of fusses at him. And then a little bit later, Anderson James, who is a tenant farmer in the area. Okay. Uh, apparently, he and Tom maybe weave baskets in the evenings and that's not a euphemism right no no, no it's not a euphemism. <laughs> they, they, basically it, tom made a point of saying hey anderson i feel not well don't come up to weave baskets <laughs> it really does sound like a euphemism it does. it's not don't we're not gonna weave baskets together <laughs> okay it's not a euphemism they're not gonna weave baskets together that evening okay it turns into the nighttime and then tom Everybody's getting ready for bed. He does two weird things. Uh-huh. He shaves. Okay. Apparently, that's men... only done in the morning. Yes, and he did it in the night. <gasps> Why? <gasps> I know. And then, okay, Zoe, this is middle Georgia. Yes. I have lived in Macon, Georgia in August. Yes. It is hot. Yes. It doesn't feel good. <laughs> <laughs> he puts on long johns. Which are, like, yeah. long underwear. I'm wearing pants. I'm wearing a long shirt. This is my long underwear that I'm wearing to bed. Uh-huh. That's not something you put on mm-hmm. on an August 5th night. No. In middle Georgia. Then. Then. They have a cook who doesn't live in the house but lives around the house. And she needed some medicine. Okay. And she was like, they'll have medicine. It's midnight. There's a dog chained in the yard who barks at people. The dog barks at her okay. coming up for medicine. So she doesn't, like, she kind of stays away. And then Tom yells out, go away, essentially. He tells her to leave. Okay. Which is just, he's not the nicest guy, Mm-mm. in case you're getting that. But, like, not just the people that he's close to. It's just, like, he's kind of mean to everybody. Right. Well, the dog's barking at her. The guy's telling her to leave. She leaves. Of course. The dog doesn't bark again until dawn. When Tom Wolfirk, in his bloody long johns, runs out of the house and to the house of a tenant farmer, Green Lockett. Uh Uh-huh. He gets him and Anderson James, and he tells them, they're killing my family. 
They're killing my family. I mean, not exactly. I think he said they got paw or something. Okay. But something along those lines, they're killing them. Okay. And he says, I need you two to come up with me to the house right now and save everybody. And they're both like, no. We're not, <laughs> we're not doing that. <laughs> really? Okay. Cause, okay. Yeah. This guy is just, he's covered in blood. Yeah. He's like, I need you to come back with me to the house. I feel like if I was, like, a manly man in that time, I would go back with him in the house. Yeah, but they know Tom. True. Okay. Okay. (laughs) They know Tom. And here's what Tom is telling them. Because it's like, okay, well, you are the most... Think about it like this. Of the people there, you are the most able-bodied man there. You do have a 20-year-old guy, but you are 27. Technically... I think people, men are in the prime of their lives at 28. Uh-huh. Here's a weird fun fact I know. <laughs> Yay. Yay. Anyways, 27. It's like, okay, so why did you leave? <laughs> yeah. Um, Tom basically said that he heard fighting and yelling and thumping coming from his parents' room. Well, honey, that's just when... <laughs> no, no. <laughs> like, as in yeah. violence and violence. death coming yes. from the parents' room. Richard, his 20-year-old brother, he says, oh, Richard ran in there to help them, but as I didn't have a weapon on me, I just opened up my window, went out, and shut the window behind me. How do you get covered in blood, then? He didn't specify... Exactly. (laughs) See, the story isn't adding up. I wouldn't go with him. Yeah. Um, But, okay, he actually didn't specify that he shut the window, but the window was shut when they got back, and they're like, you took the time to shut the window when you're trying to save your family, supposedly? Right. Anyway, he's like James and Lockett, Anderson James, Green Lockett, uh, get people, get help. Okay. And so those two go out and get help. Tom goes back to the house where he's alone for 20 minutes. Oh, my gosh. Yes. I don't know why, if you're trying to get help. Anyway, he goes back and people start getting there, the help that starts being brought, but also, like, they sent a messenger into Macon Mm -hmm. who, like, rode on a horse that was, like, foaming at the mouth at that point because it was sweating so much. Mm -hmm. And news spread fast. 3,000 people ended up coming to this house this morning. Jeez, um. It, people were interested. You know, I've heard a lot about that, like, in murders that happen in that area, like, that time period, especially in, like, rural areas. You just go to it. You just, you just go, go you see what's up. There was one story I heard, I forget exactly where, if you know what I'm talking about, please send us an email to Haunted Hospital. I thought Hosp- you met me. I was like, I know nothing. <laughs> if you know what we're talking about, please send us an email to hauntedhospitalitypodcast at gmail.com. But anyway, so basically, like, the people went and they wanted to take a souvenir back home. And so they just grabbed whatever they could. Mm-hmm. And by the time, like, everything was done, even the bricks to the house were gone. Because people were just taking bricks. What? Okay, there's no reports of that happening here. Okay. But it did get really interesting with this amount of people. So when people start to arrive, and I'm not talking about necessarily the 3,000 at this point, but, like, the people who were sent to help, Tom is cleaned up. He is in different clothes. Why would you do that if your family's just been murdered? You know, I don't know if he gives an explanation to that. (laughs) Um, They cannot find his bloody long johns. And the unfortunate thing for Tom is that he didn't exactly clean up well enough. So he goes out to greet people. People are getting a good look at him. Mm -hmm. This guy who's already kind of basically the suspicious guy of the area. Mm -hmm. There's blood inside his ear. You can see it if you're looking close. And there's blood on his leg. Mm-hmm. So he didn't get everything. But people have already seen him covered with it, so... Any- Only a couple people have seen him covered in it. True. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, you're making me second guess. I'm sorry. We- no, no, no. <laughs> you should. This is... We're getting to the truth of it, you know? Uh-huh. We're getting to the truth of things. Let's second guess things. Um, now, people who get there go into the house. This includes a photographer, which is, like, really interesting because I read a part of this. I guess photography was still, like, kind of rare at that point. Mm -hmm. So the writer in the Savannah Morning News was like, and he forever took what was in that house and put it upon a glass plate forever. (laughs) Just talking about how cool the fact of photography is. Like, Uh whoa, guy took pictures. Yeah, anyway, they went into the house, and I'm going to tell you what was seen okay i read it in graphic detail i'm not going to say it in exactly graphic detail but i do want you to get 
the like general ju- picture. Mm-hmm. There is blood on the ceiling, mm-hmm. blood on the walls, blood pooling on the floor. There are bodies in two of the bedrooms. Okay. The first bedroom, the parents' room, has uh, both parents mm-hmm. killed. It has the baby killed. Mm-hmm. It has Richard Jr., the 20-year-old. Okay. Pearl, the 17-year-old. And Charles, the 5-year-old. All killed, and those three are on the floor. I'm guessing by an axe. Yeah, it was an axe. Sorry. Yeah. there. Yeah. I'm getting to that in the second. Oh, okay. Okay. Anyway, I have a plan. I'm sorry. sorry. I have a plan. <laughs> uh, in the second bedroom, Maddie's aunt was unfortunately visiting at the exact wrong time. Mm. So she's 80. She's dead in the bed. She was killed by an axe, too. Uh, Rosebud is dead. Mm-hmm. And then Annie, is, who's a 10-year-old, is also dead. But she is dead kneeling by the window. She had been trying to get it open so she could run away. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. And a short-handled axe was found dropped on the floor by the front door inside. Okay. And just to, I don't know, I read these descriptions. Okay, you are murdering nine people because nine people were murdered that night. You're already not humane in doing it, obviously. Mm-hmm. But... The descriptions, it makes it very clear he went for the head mm-hmm. rather than for the neck. So I think, okay, if you want to kill people and you want to kill them just super quickly, mm-hmm. go for the neck. Yeah. And then they don't suffer. But there were mentions of heads bashed. In. Like, it was the head, which makes me think there was a lot of anger and it was very malicious. Right. Yeah. So everybody was struck more than once. I believe so. Um, okay. You know, I didn't, I kind of, I, I read it, and but I didn't linger over it to make sure that I got everything, you know, just because it was so, just so graphic. Mm-hmm. There was one set of bloody footprints in the house. There were no bloody footprints found in the boys' bedroom because neither of the boys, so the theory is that three of the children, Richard and Pearl and Charles, heard what was going on in the parents' room because that's where everything started, went gotcha. in to try to stop it, and then were attacked as they entered the room, killed immediately, and then put in kind of like one by one or something as they came in. Right. Yeah. They didn't find any bloody footprints in the boys' bedroom, but they did find a red stain on the floor. Tom says it was a thing called Spanish fly, given to him as like by his friends as a prank. So I looked at what Spanish fly is, and it turns out it's just like an aphrodisiac maybe you would get at the apothecary or something okay i do you want to hear my theory or do you want me to like wait until all this is done to tell me your theory theory. okay your theory i think that the bloody footprints are from before he went to get help he was walking through wasn't paying attention to where he was walking got them in the house Mm -hmm. and then when he went out to get help probably if you're going across grass before dawn and stuff and a long enough ways away my guess is the blood came off into the grass. Mm-hmm. And so when he came back, he wasn't trailing blood, but he probably took off the bloody long johns in his room, put them on the floor. And my uh, guess is that is the red stain. Okay. He's looking super suspicious right now in front of about 3,000 people. I'd say, yeah, yeah. And the coroner calls a thing called the coroner's jury, which I did not know could exist. Do you know what the coroner's jury is? No. It's actually exactly what it sounds like, okay. where something, a coroner comes up and he's like, this is incredibly suspicious. He picks people out of the crowd. Mm-hmm. Now, I believe they are all white men. He picks <laughs> them out of the crowd and, uh, not the crowd, obviously, but the people he picks. Right. They're all white men. And he says, um, we need to figure out what happened so we can arrest. So it's not a jury is in, we are sentencing you to jail or death or whatever. Well, you are kind of sentencing to jail in terms of we're going to arrest this person, but we need to figure out what's happening. People went, looked to Tom right away because one thing to note is that he is looking nervous Mm -hmm. rather than heartbroken that his entire family died. Gotcha. A quick note for people, just because, okay, this made me think of two cases in particular that I've watched documentaries on in the past couple months. It made me think of Chris Watts, who murdered his wife and two daughters. And then it made me think of Scott Peterson, who was convicted of killing his wife, Lacey Peterson. The reason I thought of 
both of them is because they received a lot of media attention for not looking so concerned and worried and scared. Gotcha. And sad. Yeah. Let's say you're innocent. Okay, you didn't do anything. But there's a lot of cameras in front of you. And I feel like a lot of people want to seem stoic. Right. Don't seem stoic. (laughs) Let out your emotions. Be like, I'm really sad about this. This sucks. I'm scared. Let people know that you're feeling this way because otherwise you look so suspicious. Right. And, I mean, there are some people who immediately, like, genuinely, like, go into shutdown mode. But that's different from emotion. Like, they go into the, basically, a zombie mode. And that I feel like that's different and noticeably different than but just, But you're not acting they don't nervous. Care. Yeah. You're not acting fidgety. Okay, back to Tom. <laughs> okay. Everything is pointing to him because he is looking suspicious and his story is not adding up. For example... Why would he shut the window if you are running to get help for your family and the intruders are already inside? Right. It's like you don't have to worry about them coming in again, you know? In fact, let them leave. Just open up the window, let them go out of there. And Uh, he claims that there's multiple intruders. There's only one set of footprints, only one weapon. He said he heard multiple people laughing during the murder. And he also said that during the 20 minutes he was alone there, he heard the back gate shut. So he was like, oh, they left. Okay, great. Oh, yeah. Um... Another thing pointing to it is that nobody heard the dog bark between when the cook was told to leave by Tom right. and when Tom was running away from the house to get help. I'm do using you, quotes. Do you think that they were already dead when the cook came? I don't. The account that I read that mentions the cook in particular mm-hmm. said, okay, at like midnight she came and then at 1.30 he started the killings. I don't know how they all know determined that. all this, but I mean, there was a lot of research done about this case. Okay. And a lot of, I mean, like, every newspaper was talking about it. It was, it made the front page of the New York Times. Okay. This was sensationalized. But also there are actual good accounts of what happened. Right. So I'm just trusting that because I don't have access to all of the newspapers. hmm The next is, why would the intruders kill everyone and not take anything? Okay. Like, okay, if you're robbing the place... You don't have to kill everybody. <laughs> yeah. And then nothing seemed too out of place. And, of course, the one set of bloody footprints. hmm The sheriff knew that the jury was going to call him guilty. So the sheriff is there. And he knew that the jury was going to say it was Tom. Mm-hmm. So to preempt that, he went ahead and secretly arrested him and brought him away from the crowd because he figured as soon as the jury announces, okay, we think Tom is guilty, then the crowd's going to hang him. And it's 3,000 people. Oh. Yeah. So he takes him back, I think, to Macon, okay. and I have Tom Woolfork's full verbatim statement to the press that afternoon after he's been taken to okay. Macon. My name is Thomas G. Woolfork. I am 27 years old. I was married about three months ago. My wife has not been with me for a month or more. I have been at my father's house for a week, working in the field for wages. Last night, about two hours before day, I heard a blow in my father's room, which was back of mine. My brothers Richard and Charlie were sleeping in the room with me. Richard is the next oldest brother and is 20 years old. Charlie is eight years old. Soon I heard another blow and a groan proceeding from my father's room. I also heard him fall. My brother Richard ran into the room. Not having a weapon of any kind, I jumped out the window at the head of my bed and ran down to Green Lockett's house, 400 yards from the house, to give the alarm to the neighbors. At the gate of our yard, I heard my sister scream. I sent Lockett to tell the neighbors, Messrs. Smith and Yates, and waited about half an hour for them to come. Meanwhile, I went back to the house and went in through the hall to see if they were really murdered. I found that they were. Father and mother were on their bed with their heads crushed in. Mother's head was lying on the floor. I picked her up and felt of her. All had been killed with father's axe and were dead. Father was lying on the bed as usual. On the floor were my brothers Charlie and Richard and my sister Pearl, 17 years old, who had ran into the room and were killed there. I went in barefooted to the room where my aunt, Mrs. West, 80 years old, and the children were sleeping. I found that all of them had been knocked in the head. The floors were covered with blood, hence my footprints. Annie, my sister, aged 10 years, was lying on the floor, and Rosebud, aged 6 years, was in the bed. I am sick and don't want to talk anymore. Come tomorrow. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So he is maintaining his innocence, Mm -hmm. even though it seems 
very obvious. That it was him. Yes, yes. And to make matters worse, a couple of days later, they found his bloody long johns and socks in the well. So he had stashed them there uh-huh. afterward, which innocent people don't normally stash their things unless they feel just really guilty about things. Yeah. Yeah. So the prosecution says that he did this to get the inheritance. And I'm about to tell you some specific things numbers? about inheritance. No, not numbers. Okay. But things about inheritance and the logistics of it. Okay. So because the land wasn't just Richard's, okay. Richard Sr.'s, it was Maddie's as well. And it was given to them by her dad. Right. So, was her dad still alive? Yes. Okay. Okay, if just Richard Sr. and Maddie were killed, then it would go to Maddie's kids, not Richard Sr.'s. So, what he needed to do was kill Maddie first. So, it would go to Richard Sr. So, if Richard Sr. died, his kids would be in the loop. Right. But you also kind of, I think it was that her kids were maybe prioritized because it was originally from her father. Mm-hmm. And so he needed to kill all of them as well. Basically, there was a very specific order he needed to kill them in where his dad was kind of killed last. Okay. I think. <laughs> I've heard of things like this, yeah. Yes. And in order for him to get the inheritance, except if you are going to kill everybody in the house and you need to start with Maddie at least it would be very difficult to kill Maddie and the baby mm. and then have the dad wake up and then have to kill him. Right. Because I'm assuming he's strongish, you know, or at least would put up a f- bigger fight. Mm-hmm. So he kills the dad while he's sleeping. Or, okay. Uh, yeah, he kills him. <laughs> I, I, I wanted to, like, see Allegedly. If, allegedly, but no. He, kill, he kills the dad when the dad is sleeping and then goes... For Maddie and then the baby and then the three older siblings walk walk in or run in or whatever. Actually, I feel really bad about Charles, who's five, Mm -hmm. and ran into because, you know, he probably followed his brother in. Yeah. Anyway. So they basically said he wanted the inheritance because there was a lot of people being like, yeah, he was down on luck with money and he needed money and he kept talking about money. Right. The defense tried a couple of tactics to say he didn't do this. The first is that he loved his parents. But (laughs) (laughs) he loved his parents. He would never do it. He loved Maddie. But then they had a witness whose last name was called Will come up and be like, no, I've heard him talking bad about Maddie. He didn't really like Maddie at all. Yeah. So that, that one was kind of shot. Then they tried to blame a few different black men for the crime. Of course. Yes. You know, I mean... Richard Wolfork fought in the Confederacy, all these things. And yes, there were beefs uh, between him and like local black men and stuff. And so they tried to play them up, but it wasn't sticking at all. The jury was like, okay, we're, we have to listen to this because it's a court proceeding, but that's not what's actually going on. Right. Yeah. And Then the one that ended up just kind of being the center of their argument because everything else fell apart was that one person couldn't have committed these crimes. You killed, you're saying one person killed nine people. And nine people, like, yeah, it's a family, but they weren't all just little kids. You know, Mm -hmm. you had Pearl, you had Richard. And I mean, to be honest, that would probably be the one that's closest to telling me that he didn't do it. I think he did it. Mm -hmm. Very clearly, I think he did it. But... It is a lot of people, but if you think about it, like, sequentially or something, with how they laid it out, it kind of makes sense. Right. Oh, by the way, there's evidence that he tried to move the bodies to make it look like he didn't kill his dad first. Okay, yeah. Yeah. So, before the jury sentenced him guilty, Mm -hmm. there were uh, cries of hang him in the room. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Then the jury sentenced him guilty, and then there had to be a retrial because of the hang him cries because the judge was letting it happen and they're like, that's not fair. And also apparently inadmissible evidence, so I don't know what they're talking about exactly with that. So he has another trial and they're also saying that he's guilty. Okay. (laughs) And then it's 1890. Yes. Georgia, his wife, Uh uh, divorces him officially because she's like, she probably wanted to make it like as obvious as possible that she's not with him. Right. (laughs) She's like, I made a mistake three years ago. It was three <laughs> weeks. I'm yeah. out of there. Uh, he hangs in Perry, Georgia, which is near Macon. Okay. And there are 8,000 people. 8,000 
thousand people. They had trained specifically bringing these people in. Wow. Yeah. Um, guess what these people, some of them were eating. Hmm. You're not going to guess. I'm, I'm guessing it's not like popcorn or anything like that. No. Um, hmm, let's see. Well, you never told us what they grow on the farm. Oh, what God. were they eating? Possum sandwiches. Excuse me? <laughs> they were eating possum sandwiches. It, and this was like one of the last uh, public executions in Georgia. Okay. I don't know. I wanted to add that and in there, but it you seems... You bring possum sandwiches. Gather around, kids. Oh, my god. I mean, okay, let's see. You're traveling because you really want to see this guy hang. Yeah. You hit a possum. You, you cook it up because you don't want to waste food. It really was a different world. <laughs> it really was a different... Like, that's what I'm learning most by doing this podcast is, like, man, it doesn't make sense. Dang. Yeah. The story is not exactly over, though okay. it's very close to being over. Because lately, and by lately I mean, like, late 20th century, okay. there is a push toward looking at another suspect, Simon Cooper, who was a son of sharecroppers uh, in the area uh-huh. and who was a teenager. And he left shortly after the murders took place. Okay. Ten years later in Sumter, South Carolina, he ended up murdering a family in basically the same way with a short-handled axe. Okay. And there was a note that was supposedly found that he put into a diary or something that said that he killed the Wolfworks. Okay. This person wrote a book called Shadow Chasers, The Wolfwork Tragedy Revisited. It was Carolyn DeLoach. And she's going through primary documents. That is her method of doing this. And so she finds, I, I believe she found it. I don't know if I believe that it was actually a note. Mm-hmm. Or I believe that she found evidence of it. Okay. But I don't know if that means it actually existed. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so did, she didn't find the item itself. She just found... I think, but to be honest, I'm not completely sure of okay. that. But even if it did exist, I the, the idea is this guy kind of would confess to crimes he didn't do anyway, it seems. Mm-hmm. And also... You'd be surprised how many people confess to crimes they didn't do. Right. I mean, I guess the point of this is it was in a diary format, which, yeah, okay, I get that. Mm-hmm. But I really don't think this guy did it. I think that, okay, if you are in the area when this incredibly influential trial happens. Especially if you're kind of young. If you're kind of young, if you're kind of inclined to do this stuff anyway. Yeah. I guess you take notes and you do it. Yeah. Um, and if he idolized it, maybe he could have tricked himself into thinking that maybe he did do it. That's totally possible. Yeah. Because, I mean, this guy is not the greatest because obviously he, he, murdered he did family. this again. Yeah. Yeah. So I just wanted to put it in there that there are, like, some people you will go around on the internet and they'll say Simon Cooper did this. I strongly believe that it was Tom Wolfark who did it. Okay. Nearly everything except for that possible diary entry points in that direction. Yeah. Yeah. And real quick, I want to bring in how I am personally connected to this story. Right, you did tease that to me before we started recording. Yes. So the Wolfert family is buried in Rose Hill Cemetery okay. in Macon, Georgia, which is a cemetery that I've played in as a child. I would go there quite often because it is actually a really beautiful place. You can look out at the river at it. It's right near the uh, river walk. And I would just respectfully play there hang out there my parents would bring me there because the idea is i've never i never looked at cemeteries as this is a creepy place to not go Mm -hmm. but as in here's a place people are laid to rest you go here to visit Mm -hmm. your dad and there's also really pretty sculptures and they taught me you know don't step on the graves always be very respectful but cemeteries don't have a have to be a place that you're afraid of and mm-hmm. so when i saw that they were buried there i don't know i just i thought it was interesting yeah to you know i used to play there maybe i passed by their graves you okay, used that is to kind play of in a graveyard and you don't consider yourself spooky it was always during the day Uh uh-huh there was one beautiful sunset moment though you know when i was younger i would hang out with a friend a lot um her name does friend exist yes her name is Lindsay. (laughs) i would spend time with her family a lot and um they told me that if you passed cemetery or graveyard because they are different if you passed one like in a car you had to hold your breath while you're passing it because it was disrespectful to breathe when they couldn't breathe wow that's 
intense. And it wasn't until I was like... What do you like, do if you visit a graveyard? <laughs> I've never visited a graveyard except for, for a funeral. You and I went into a graveyard. We didn't go into it. We were outside of it. I thought we went into it. No, it was gated. Oh, okay. We took pictures through the gates. Oh, yeah. yeah. There's supposed to be a ghost that shows up in the photos. Yeah. We're not just random. Yeah. She told us to take photos. Yeah. But, yeah. So we had very different experiences surrounding graveyards. We did. Well, this was a cemetery. It's not connected to a church. Fun fact, it's a graveyard if it's connected to a church. It's a cemetery if it's not. And the way you can remember that is because a graveyard, a yard is attached to a house. So it's a graveyard, so it's connected to the church. Okay, cool. Yeah. Well, this turned into a nice, fun fact lesson. The more you know. All right. Well, if you enjoy today's story, please subscribe and review you can find us on apple podcasts spotify google podcasts stitchers and basically everywhere else except for pandora right because they don't like us yet (laughs) and if you have your own spooky story that you'd like to share if you have a recommendation for a southern story you'd like us to cover or you mean a ghost story Southern spooky story. Okay, yeah. cool, cool, cool. Yeah, yeah, just, yeah. As long as you have the spooky in yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. If you have one of those you'd like us to share, or if you have um, any feedback you'd like to give us, please send us an email to hauntedhospitalitypodcast at gmail.com. You can also visit our website, hauntedhospitality.wordpress.com, and you can see all of our show notes and our links to sources there. Yes, and if you are in the Twitter sphere or the Instagram sphere, or now we're on Facebook, follow us, join us, like us, all that. We're on Facebook at Haunted Hospitality Mm -hmm. Podcast. Actually, I don't know our specific at name on Facebook. You can find us, though. We're there. And then on Twitter at Haunted Hosts. Yes. And on Instagram at Haunted Hospitality. We hope to see you there. All right. Thank you, guys. Stay Stay spooky. spooky.